What's up, gentlemen? This is Rising Phoenix Podcast, the podcast about how to rise up after your divorce. I'm your host, Michael Rhodes. Let's get into it. Joining me today is Avram. Uh, Avram, let's just jump right into it and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your, you know, give us a little info on you. Sure. I'm a psychologist who works a lot with men, uh, both in individual and groups and couples. And um, I have been writing about and talking about for the last few years, the idea that men are afraid of women in their intimate relationships. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and and that fear, what is it? I mean, it, it, it leads to uh, loneliness, I would guess, right? Among many other things, absolutely, it leads to loneliness. It leads to unhappiness. It leads to unhappy marriages. It leads to a lack of closeness between men and women. It leads to a lack of closeness between men and men. Okay, so well, let's dive into to to, to loneliness, um, sure. and, and maybe that there'll be some answers there in terms of why why you believe men are afraid of women uh, uh, in relationships. Um, but why why are men so lonely? Well, what's interesting is if you look at research on boys, Mm -hmm. boys friendship with, I mean, I'm not, I don't know what your childhood was like, but uh, I actually just reconnected with one of my two closest friends from elementary school just this past weekend. And one of the things we talked about is neither one of us has, like, I don't remember the inside of his house. Hmm. I just remember his yard and my yard and the street. And the park, we spent all our time outside playing together. And my relationships with my friends as a boy were as intensely close as girls' relationships are with girls. What happens, though, is that boys get the message, and it seems to happen, sadly, sometime right around the beginning of grade school, that they shouldn't be close with other boys. They shouldn't be close with girls either, that they should be oriented towards success and achievement, getting good grades, moving a four in the world, and relationships are sort of left by the wayside. Um, And it's usually, there's a wonderful book by Thomas Joyner called Lonely at the Top. It's often in middle age, you know, we talk about the midlife crisis, and often what's happening then is men sort of look around and go, okay, I'm at the top of the mountain, but I'm up here all by myself. And it's actually kind of lonely. And what am I going to do with all this money and power and success if I'm unhappy? Yeah. Well, and what are, I mean, besides um, the feeling of loneliness, what, what are some of the consequences of being lonely, of not having close friendships for, for men in particular? That's a really good question because, of course, I think a lot of men would ask that question and say, well, so what? I'm on right. the top of the mountain. You, right. You're just you're just talking about loneliness because you're jealous, right? right. But but some of the fast, I mean, there is some obvious stuff, which is unhappiness. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I say to men is a couple things. One is I ask them, I said, do you have friends? And every man says, yes, I do. And I said, no, wait a minute. I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. By friends, I mean people that you would talk to the way you're talking to me right now. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, of course <laughs> not. Right. Yeah. So part of it is that we know that just on a very simple level, that decision making people make better decisions when they take multiple points of view into account. So you're not taking any other points of view into account. You're like a hamster in a wheel. You just have your own thoughts to make decisions and you tend to make the same bad decisions again and again and again because you're not connected to other people for feedback. But on a more um, a less obvious level, but maybe more important, but pretty damn important, is that loneliness as is as big a risk factor for early mortality as smoking cigarettes. So in other words, if your doctor was really doing his job, so the doctor, your doctor weighs you, checks your weight, because we know weight is a problem for mentality. Your doctor asks you if you smoke cigarettes and how much you drink and do you do drugs. But if he was really following the data, your doctor would say, and do you have any friends? Because that is actually as big a risk for things, people who, who do not have other relationships. And this comes from the Harvard Adult Development Study, which has been going on for like 70 years. They took um, students at Harvard, long time, I think it's 70 years ago, and they've been following them this whole time. And much to their surprise, one of the biggest determiners of, what, of not only happiness, but health was how well-connected people, men were to other men. So it's not just 
It's not yeah. just girly stuff like uh, emotions. Right. It, you actually live longer. So, you know, you're out there at the gym pumping iron and watching what you eat and all that, and then taking years off your life by not having any friendships. Uh, it, it just, it blows me away. And, and, and here's the thing. I, I, I believe it. Uh, I think it's true. I think we are a, um, you know, a tribal species, a social species, however yes. you want to describe us. Um, Very much. But, but I, I see this firsthand, the, the struggles of getting men together. Um, yes. I run a Facebook group. There's 5,600 men in there. Um, I have a website. I have a Discord server. Like I, I have ability for men to get together. And, and it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a little bit easier, like sort of over the internet and, and you can send messages back and forth. But to physically get someone out and, and meet and, and, you know, have group events is sometimes a, a struggle. And, and I don't, I don't know what to do. And so that's, that's my question to you is um, maybe not on that granular of a subject, but uh, it, uh, in, in general, like what, what do yeah. we do if we are lonely and we are men and we don't want to be, or, or maybe we just are so afraid to be anything other than that. What, what, what's the recommended, how do we combat this? I think maybe what those men would respond to would be a more in-depth offering. So in other words, if we just say, um, get together and watch the game, yeah, right. they'll come, they won't come. Right. But what's really surprised me is how eager men are to talk to other men. I started doing men's therapy groups about 10 years ago. Mm. And the night before the first group, I'm standing and, you know, getting ready to go into the room. And I thought, Avram, this is really the worst idea you've ever had in your life <laughs> because they're not going to talk. They're going to they're going to sit there. They're going to talk about sports or they're going to talk about the weather or they're going to talk about work, but they're not going to talk about themselves. Well, that group within its first two meetings was hugging each other at the end of the group. Uh, I mean, I, it's it's my most dedicated group. It's the group we changed the day of the group so that we could meet more often during the year. So what I've learned is that um, it's easy to think that men don't want to connect with each other because they kind of bow up and pretend that they don't or act as if they don't. But you don't have to scratch very far to find that loneliness and that urge. Because again, we all experienced when we were younger, you talk to guys about college and a lot of guys are still connected with right. friends they had in college. Those were deep, enduring or high school same thing yep um so it's not like we don't want to um it's just that we get awfully distracted the, the other time that guys surface and i know you do a lot of work with guys going through divorce that's the other time that guys surface because yeah. they their wives have been taking care of their social world seamlessly so that, oh saturday night we're going to the jones great i like him right but then she leaves and he's like <laughs> yeah yeah who am I going to talk to? I don't have any friends. I don't know what to do. Guys, I've worked with so many guys who are terrified when they get divorced. Being alone is just absolutely terrifying. They just don't know what to do. And being alone with themselves is is very uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I see it all the time. I Guys uh, dive into the next relationship uh, immediately sure. try and go out dating and you know and absolutely and it's one of those things where no, nobody i shouldn't say nobody but rarely do people actually listen like i I've, I've been there and i've done that and it didn't no, help they don't. yeah they, they yeah they have to experience it uh on their own but i speaking of that it's a good segue so you, you started this off talking about how um you know women uh men and men are a little bit afraid of women um and i think the context uh is within a relationship setting correct yes and so can you talk about talk about that a little bit? Like, why, why sure. is that? Um, and, and what what does it lead to? I would guess divorce, but. Well, at least a lot of things. Um, it the, it comes from the fact that sadly, I mean, I'd like to think this is changing, but but not so much is that most of us, meaning men, were raised almost entirely by women. Mm. So we had maybe we had a dad, but in terms of our close relationship was probably much more with a woman and dad was sort of more of, you know, maybe he took you to soccer practice or things like that. But in, you've talked to most people and let's say, who did you talk to? Who did you feel close to? Who talked you in? And I, it is changing and I think this will change, but um, we become, we become not only very de dependent on our mothers because they're the only one, 
but also there's a dance that goes on um, where you're watching your mom really carefully. And so, you know, the old saying, uh, if mom ain't happy, nobody's happy has truth in it. So that you, so since mom is the only source of closeness, you have to watch her really closely. And we developed this dance where we're watching to see what we do, how it affects, oh, she liked that, I'll do more of that. Oh, I made that cute face and she liked that. Or, oh, I did that and uh, she didn't like that. So we get into this habit of one, being nervous about losing the connection and two, sort of adapting who we are to please women. Now we're starting to sound familiar, huh? Yeah. When you talk yeah. about men adapting themselves who they are and being afraid to be themselves. And so women grow up, if you're heterosexual, you marry a guy and it does, it's not the same. But men grow up if you're heterosexual and marry a woman and you're right back in the middle of the same. So it's interesting mm. that in conflict in heterosexual relationships, men get more physiological, more physiologically distressed and it lasts longer. The conflict bothers men more than it threatens us. Uh, it, it, that shit leaves me speechless, to be honest with you. Like, <laughs> I, I think that's a compliment. But I'm not sure. uh, well, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's profound. And I think, um, it, you know, every time I do these things, I always, you know, I run it through my mind, of course, right? My right, experience is my life. I'm sure. listening and I'm thinking about, huh, well, that. Yep. Uh. -huh, yep. Check all those boxes. Yeah, like right. my my dad but, was. But of uh, course it does. Because let me tell you how I got to this. Of yep. course it checks all the boxes. Because the way I got this was listening to guys talk. <laughs> well, it's because just these are not like these are not brilliant ideas I thought up. <laughs> this is what men talk, tell me every day. Well, but I think I think it's um, because we are sort of isolated and sort of closed in a lot. I think. Um, we don't think about these things. We don't talk about these things in general. And, and, and so you don't, I I don't know what another man's experience is, is in terms of um, like to, to compare in, in that kind of way, because we, we don't talk about these things, right. We don't that's talk fine. about. And so when you hear it, like, Oh no, that's, that's, that's like kind of a majority of men. And you're like, Oh shit. Yes. Okay. But it's not just men. It's a little more insidious than that. It's this, it's the culture as well. Oh, I'll tell yeah. you, I just got, I just got invited to do a webinar by an organization in England mm. and the executive director and I had a phone call. She was very excited. And then she took it to her board and much to my surprise came back and said, Oh, we've changed our minds because you don't meet our criteria for diversity and inclusion. Oh. And, and I sent a rather pointed email back, which I know you're not supposed to do, <laughs> but I said, you know what? Um, Talking about the internal lives of men, men are a minority. I understand we, we are privileged, but when it comes to understanding what goes on inside of men, that's an underrepresented field. Oh, yeah, I would say wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, but here's this board saying, well, we don't we're not interested in the internal lives of men. Well, and, and so you're, you're, you're sort of involved in this field. Do you, is that, is that an anomaly that, I mean, I know that there's sort of a stigma um, and there are issues around men expressing themselves, but I, I always felt like that was um, sort of, I don't say our fault because. Well, how did we get, how did we get that? What made us that way? Well, yeah, there are the reasons, right. Right. But, yes. but, but, but we've all, but, but I think we know that in some ways, I don't know that we acknowledge it, but I think in, it, we, we kind of inherently know like, yeah, I don't really talk about my feelings. And so we, we bear some responsibility there, but, but I'm curious as to, do you see that type of occurrence um, with like, you know, professionals? Oh, absolutely. Uh, really? Yeah. So, so it's not, that wasn't an anomaly like that. It, it's, no, not at all. I have gotten grief from so many different quarters for this book. I've had dear friends say to me, you shouldn't write this book. This is, it's not a good thing. You should not talk about men. Basically saying that if you talk about men in a sympathetic way, it will be taken as justification for bad behavior. Listen, men oh, have done it's not their fault. They're scared. Uh, well, listen, men have done some fucked up things. There's no question. But, Absolutely. But, but, I mean, I mean but so why? So women. Well, I mean, that, that's a, probably a pretty nuanced uh, discussion. I mean, I mean, it probably all it, I think all of it right boils down to childhood. I mean, every everything that you are is shaped in your childhood. And, and, and you're right. I know for me, my dad was a truck driver, so he was not around like very often. Um, so that rings true to me. And I think perhaps 
you know, the Gen X and, and forward, you know, that we were probably the last generation. Um, well, it stopped there where, where mom stayed home. I mean, I know it happens here and there, but like in general, um, the dads were gone and working and the moms were home. I think that's changed, but, but absolutely Gen X and, and, and previous, I think were definitely raised by their mothers. Um, sure. and you, you kind of mentioned this, that, you know, uh, you think it's going to change. Do you, because of two family, you know, two, two income families, is that, is it changing and, and, and how so, and is it for the better? Because I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if having both parents not around very much is any better, but, but is, is it changing? One of the, one of the pivotal moments in my life, it's probably more than 30 years ago was when I took my son into a McDonald's bathroom to change him. And they had a changing station in a McDonald's that yeah. probably happened a little more than 30 years ago. Up until that point, I had changed his diapers on nasty bathroom mm -hmm. sinks yeah. because nobody thought to put a changing station in a men's room. Right. There used to be a joke when I was raising my kid. What do you call a dad in a park on Saturday with his kids? Divorced. Because <laughs> dads, true. if they weren't divorced, didn't take their kids to the park on Saturday. So those things seem anachronistic and funny to us now, which says to me, things really are changing. Now, what did, we're, go ahead. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Like, why? Is it, is it men just realizing, well, that way wasn't a good way, so I'd want to do it differently? I think most guys, when they have a kid, they want to be close with their kid. And I think we give them more permission now to do mm -hmm. what they want to do. I mean, I don't know if you have children, but, you know, mm -hmm. there's that moment where the, where the baby's born and they put the baby in your arms and something happens. You know, oh, you yeah. don't want to throw it away. You want to hold it close. Yes. And so I think it's all there. It's all wired in us the same way it is for women. But we've denied all that for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I doubt if my dad, I remember one time my dad said to me, son, let's go to the park and throw the ball around. I was like, who is this? <laughs> like it was happened one time. I had no idea if he was drinking in the middle of the day or what was going on, but it was the one and only time he ever suggested that we go hang out together. It made mm -hmm. me very nervous. So do you think, it, I mean, it sounds like it's probably, and these things are, there's probably so much nuance, but like, do you think it's a sort of a pushback on the way that we were raised it, 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 like by, by us and say, you know what, I, I want to be more involved or is it society saying you should be more involved? Cause it seems like there's sort of a, a, a dichotomy here, like an opposing view. Like it's, uh, we want to be more involved. We want to be more emotional, but we're, we're told we can't be, but, but, but we still seem to be at least pushing back against that. Um, but do you, do you think the motive what, like what, what was the thing that sort of made my generation, I think, be decide to be, you know, we're going to be more involved fathers. Cause I don't, I, I don't think permission. A, you think so. The culture gives, it gives you more permission. Um, again, when I was raising my kids, it really was, you know, I work with a number of guys who were stay at home dads and would talk about how horribly uncomfortable they felt nope. anytime they'd meet another man and say, I stay home and take care of my kids. So I think the culture is changing and creating more permission so the other thing I've noticed, it's not that long ago that Thomas Thomas Eagleton withdrew from the vice presidential candidacy because he cried in a press conference. Oh, yeah. Well, you and see it all now, the time. Yeah, you I see know. It. Now, guys, you know, after the Super Bowl or, you know, whatever, right. on a game show. I mean, guys right. crying now is like a non-event. And it used to be very not long ago. So there's more permission for men to feel. And there's more permission. Um, you know, you see guys uh, after the big game that the, they grab their kids, you know, right. and they're doing the interview. Those are not images that we had 40, 50 years ago. So oh, I yeah. think we're giving different permission to men. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking, like, I'm trying to think I've ever seen, like, Joe Montana's kids. And I, I don't think I did. Like, he didn't. Probably not. Yeah, I don't think he <laughs> did that. Did Joe, did Joe Montana's kids ever see Joe Montana? <laughs> <laughs> they're probably in therapy. I'm sure of it. Um, well, well, you know, it's he, their dad has a job that takes him away from home. Yeah. A lot. Oh, sure. I, I mean, I think we all honestly, to, to be serious, I think we all need therapy because we're all raised by humans and humans are fallible. And so my parents did some, some pretty bad things. And I, I'm sure I've done, I know I've done some bad, like not, not intentionally. Right. I'm a human. I'm going to, fuck up you know that's just that's normal and natural so 
I think every, everybody should be in therapy. But it's the same as we were talking about just a little while ago. We know that people make better decisions when they incorporate multiple viewpoints. So if you're talking about your life to somebody else who has a viewpoint different than yours, chances are you're going to make better decisions. Yeah. What was it saying? Right. Two heads are better than one or whatever. Like, yeah, um, yeah that definitely holds true. So, so let's say you're a man and uh, you're, you're, you're going through the divorce and you are terrified of being alone. Um, I, I, I have a, 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 I'll call him a friend. Uh, we, we touch base fairly frequently. Um, he dove into a relationship immediately after, and now he's, he's ended that relationship, but he is scared to death of being alone. What do you say to that man? I say you need to um, reach out to whoever, whatever man in your life you think is has the potential to be your friend and invite him. And I usually suggest lunch, not drinks. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and lunch or dinner where you're going to talk, but lunch probably you won't drink dinner. You probably will. Right. And invite right. him to lunch. Um, don't play golf with them because people don't talk, talk when they play golf. Don't play tennis because people don't talk when they play tennis. Yeah. Um, invite him to share a meal with you and then sort of check him out because most of the men I end up working with two things. One is they were all a group of men who never in their lives imagined they would ever be in therapy. Yeah. And the other is each one of them keeps saying, well, I'm interested in being friends with other men, but I don't know it. Well, if, if all of them are interested, then it's probably just, you know, in, in the old days before, gay men can't or were it's not like gone away but before they were right. out as much as they are now there would be little clues they would use to identify each other uh, you know, their handkerchief a certain way or right. the friend of dorothy was a phrase that was used um, because they were trying to find other men who were compatible and it's the same for guys now you know how do you find guys and if you just say something more personal in a conversation, if you're at a work cocktail party and you and somebody says, "Hey, how are you?" and instead of saying, "Hey, I'm mm. great," you say, "Well, it's been a hard week." Yeah, and you will find out very quickly whether that is a man who might be interested in a more personal relationship. Yeah, I, I, it's funny when people ask me that that benign sort of throwaway question. I always answer honestly, and most of the time, yeah. pe people don't want to hear it. <laughs> but but I'm telling you, if you're going to ask know, me how I am, you're I'm get out. A hundred percent. Like yeah. if you're going to ask me, I'm going to tell you. Um, and, and, but, but a large majority of the time, nobody cares <laughs> because I think, you right. don't need 20 friends, you know, no, but, if, if, but, but I think, I think, I think because maybe I'm wrong here, but I think people have their own shit too. Right. And then, and, sure. if, and if, 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 if you start having a real conversation, then, then they might have to participate and they don't want to do that. Like, you know, some people don't want to talk about their feelings or what they're going yes. through. They'd rather just like absolutely ignore it. Um, well, but I, I don't why, see that as very healthy, right? That's why one of men's fears is fears of emotions. Mm. And that's why in arguments between men and win, women, why men work so hard to keep the argument rational, because if it gets too emotional, it's not that they don't want her to feel, it's that they feel themselves. They start to feel more themselves. So I want to keep you calm so that I won't get activated. What, what, why are we, and I think I know this answer, but I, I really, this is a rabbit hole. I'm going to go down it. Why are we so bad at, emo at dealing with emotions and, and avoiding them? Why are we so bad at that? It's actually pretty straightforward. It's not because we're less able. We are just as able as women, but somewhere in our childhood, we started off playing boys and girls together. And then the boys went off and started playing with the boys and the girls went off and started playing with the girls. We split up basically. Yep. And yep. what were the girls doing? The girls were practicing relationship. How were they practicing relationship? They were playing house and doctor and store, all games in which they were practicing relationships. Yep. What were we doing? We went off and practiced how to conquer the world. Right. right. Competition, aggression, so that then we come back together with girls and they've got 10 years of practice in relationships and we don't know what the hell they're talking about. So um, that's okay. And that goes well, if the guy is humble enough to sort of figure that out and say, right. well, here's a woman I could really learn a lot from. This is great. Doesn't go so well when the guy feels threatened and says, you know, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> right. I, man, there's so much to this topic. Um, I, uh, one, one thing that popped in my head, um, sometimes um, when you have uh, 
over 5,000 men in, in a group, there, there can be some, there can be some opinions. Um, one of those is that we, sh- and I don't agree with this, but I'm, I really want to get your take. We shouldn't share our emotions with women. Like save, don't, don't, don't cry in front of them. Don't, don't uh, tell them how you're really feeling. Don't open up. Don't be vulnerable. I think is probably the key to, to their, right. this, these people's view because they'll take advantage, which I, or, or, or whatever. I don't, that part I'm sure. Yeah, no, you got it right. Um, yes, you got it right. I, I, I wholeheartedly disagree. Um, but, but uh, as someone who's, who deals with this in this space, do you, do you see, first of all, I think that's horseshit. I think you'll probably agree, but is that something that is, is a truth? Like, Oh, I, I've seen so many guys and they, they tell me, Oh, I, and I started opening up and being honest. And then she left me. Is that even, is that even happen? They, like women aren't leaving men really. Yes, it does. Um, that's, that's the answer to the last part, but now let me talk about the whole thing. Circle back. Okay. First of all, there's not a right or wrong here. It depends on what you want. Okay. If you want to be alone for the rest of your life, then that's a great strategy. <laughs> okay. Fair point. <laughs> if you want to be in love with somebody, that's a really bad idea. Mm. So if you are in a relationship with somebody and you are worried that if you will be vulnerable, they will take advantage of you. I would ask you to think back over your history with that person. And has that actually happened? Mm. Or is that something you're just worried about happening? Because in most cases, it hasn't actually happened. It's more something that you're worried about happening, which comes back to the whole idea of men's fears. Now, here's the thing. It does occasionally happen. Mm. And here's why. Because this is a two-person dance, not a one-person dance. So just as men are socialized to be strong and stoic and not vulnerable, Women are socialized to be attracted to men who are strong and stoic and not vulnerable. So when men start acting more sensitive, sometimes women get a little uncomfortable. That, uh, I'm, yeah, again, I, I think I, it's not often I find myself speechless. <laughs> well, go to, go to the, I don't know if they still sell books in grocery stores, but you know, the, the women's romance novels, yeah, yeah, yeah. those books are called bodice rippers. Because in those books, men take women by force. Right. Men overcome women's resistance. So I feel so bad for young men today because on one hand, that that is a real thing. Women are familiar and comfortable with men being assertive and dumb. And then you have the Me Too movement, which says don't move without asking permission. And I don't think guys know which way is up. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree. I think there's some confusion for sure. Um, I think there are mixed messages and stuff. I think, you know, from, from, you know, earlier, like, you know, uh, be involved with your kids and, and, but, but don't talk about feelings of men, like, like you were rejected. Right. But, but yet men are still like trying to be more involved and be, be active in their kids' lives and be more emotional. So, so what, what, um, and I think, I think perhaps it's hard to, to put a nice little bow on all of this stuff and say, um, you know, this is how men should behave or, or whatever. I mean, there's obviously there's certain truths and things like, you know, don't beat the shit out of people or whatever, but like, what, what is, what, what are, what are men supposed to do? Like, how, how can you fulfill? And I don't like this it, it, to me, there's sort of a victim ishness to, to this question in a way. And I don't, so I, I don't like it that much, but, but I do think that there is some confusion and some, what the hell am I supposed to do? Um, am I supposed to be sensitive and, and, and understanding and warm and, and you right. know, be able to deal with emotions or am I supposed to be an asshole who doesn't feel anything? Like, I don't, I don't know what the fucking answer is, honestly, but I, I mean, what, what, are, what are you, what do you think? What, what, how should men conduct themselves? What, what does it mean to be a man? Even the problem with your question is that implicitly it's, it's, it's suggesting that the outcome or the answer would be based on what is approved of by women. And so my answer would be, you should strive to be yourself, Mm, be with people who who like that person. And so if you are a morning person and uh, you're with somebody who can't stand it, you get up, you know, that's a problem. That's something the two of you have to figure out. I don't think that means you should not get up early in the morning because she doesn't like it. So I think the trick is um, it's always a, it's always the starting place in any conflict between two people to have the courage to speak your truth. Yeah. So it's it's I mean in some ways it's 
individualized or, or, or yeah. relationship yes. dependent, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's never going to be a one-off answer for this is how men should behave. So every man is different. And the idea is not to be the same as other people. The idea is to be comfortable being yourself. Hmm. I, it would be nice if there was one just like cookie cutter, like this is the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be nice if that happened to be you, but if, if, if it wasn't you, it wouldn't be so nice. Well, yeah, I suppose. But I, so I, I mean, think that's, it, that's it, what gay men would say is that the, the one off cookie cutter wasn't available to me. Oh, that's very true. And so so maybe it doesn't exist then, period. Um, I don't think so. I think that that people get into a lot of hurtful places by chasing claim that doesn't exist. That's uh, I mean, that's I think feels like that's pretty profound, right? To, to come to that conclusion that and, 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 in some ways, you know that, right? Like you don't compare yeah. yourself to others. You're on your own journey, all these kind of good things. But I think there's still this like, because we get messages from society and other things, which I generally ignore. Like, I don't give a shit what Sally in California with a nose ring. I mean, maybe she's a nice person and whatever, but I don't give a shit what she thinks about me. Um, but but there is still is that, right. But there still is that sort of, there is some of that societal pressure and there is some confusion. I generally try to ignore, like someone posted in a group the other day about how women are, you know, some of these women are posting about, you know, I don't even know what it was. I can't remember. I don't know if it was toxic masculinity or all men are terrible or whatever. And I'm like, I don't get who get random people on the internet. I don't give a shit what they think, but I do think that it does. The more you hear that kind of stuff, it can put pressure on you and cause confusion. But I think to your point, I think you just ignore that shit and just be who you are. Well, you know, there, there are a lot of angry, very lonely, scared men out there. Uh, you and, hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I think you're right about that. We, I think what what we, our mistake has been that we just react to their anger and are so put off by their anger mm -hmm. that we don't look a little deeper and see that's a hurting person. Well, that okay. For someone to talk that way about women, right? That is not a happy person. No, and, and okay, but here's you're right. I, I think you're right. But as someone that's in a space to try and help men as you are and, and you're you're a professional i'm just a dude who has a mic or whatever <laughs> and uh <laughs> what what do you do uh like can you help that person do you do you, what like what should i do because i i see it all angry you hit the nail on the fucking head especially not i don't know especially but got some guys going through divorce and i know i had my moments and still have my moments where i lean on my anger like it's my my yeah. everything like my walker and i'm 90 <laughs> like sure. I, I need it that's right that's and, right. and I see that a lot. And so, okay, he's a hurt and broken man, but is he, is he even going to hear me? Like if I try and say something, you know, get into therapy, man, you're really, you're really angry, bro. You gotta, you gotta take a look at that. I mean, I, yes. I, I mean, what, yes. what every day I have that experience every, you know, almost every hour of every day. And and yes. so what, what do you do? So, so you just say, Hey, Hey man, you really ought to take, take a look at your anger. Is that, is that how you would handle it? No, that's not my place to say, uh, you know, but I might say, um, I might say, are you this angry all the time? Or is it just when you're talking about your ex-wife mm -hmm. and, you know, deep down, what really happened between the two of you? You talk about her like she's a monster. Did you always feel that way? Was there ever a time that you cared about her? Mm -hmm. What went wrong between you two? I think I just, you know, imagining these guys and, and thinking about some of them. And I just think they're to your point. I just think they're so fucking hurt. And yeah. they just, they don't know what to do. And they don't know how to access anything other than anger. And, and that's not going to help. That's not going to help them because they're hurt and they're lonely. And, you know, adopting uh, an attitude towards the world of being suspicious of half the people in the world automatically ain't going to help you be less lonely. No, but, but I don't know. Anyone. But I don't know that they see that as a problem, right? Like, and how do you make them see it? Can you like if, if they're if they're angry and they're pissed off and they're and they're lonely, do they even care? And and like I I, I mean I want to help them. That's clearly my mission in life here because I've I've been through it. I know how shitty it was and is honestly, quite frankly. It's not like it, you know, there's one day it's like, oh, this divorce is fucking awesome. <laughs> um, it sucks. You, you um, can help them as soon as they're ready to be helped and not the not a moment, sadly, not a moment before there's, there's an old joke that says, uh, how many therapists does it take to screw in a light bulb? 
only one, but first the bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I think you're right. It's just, it's tough to um, absorb the, maybe shrapnel is the correct word, the shrapnel of these, of their anger. It's tough for me. Yeah. And I, you know, woe is me heavy as the head and all that kind of shit. But like being the guy and saying, Hey man, um, man, you're really angry. And then getting like, you know, fuck you, you pussy and all this stuff. And it's, you know, it, 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 it can be daunting. Um, but I suppose at the end of the day, it's that they'll, they'll get there if they, if they want to. Right. Um, well, uh, they'll get there when things get bad enough that that the how bad things are outweighs how scared they are. So when when they get unhappy enough, then they'll get there. Hmm. A lot of times people come see me when their wife said, that's it, I've had it. Yeah. If you don't do something about fill in the blank, we're right. done. And then they call me. I was I something popped in my head, but I, I totally, totally lost it. But uh, well, I, I do there, something else. I don't know if it was the first thought, but here's another one. Um, in terms of like uh, gender roles and how things seem to be changing uh, in relationships, I, I, I get the sense that women, and I think that was the thought, it, 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 the numbers bear it out. Um, depending on who you, who you look at, 80%, 69, I've seen um, college educated women is like 90%. The divorces are filed by women mostly. Um, and I think what I'm, what I'm sorting, sort of starting to sense is it's because there's been a shift, right? And so now there are two income families. And so now women are out in the workforce, um, but they don't, and guys, some guys are probably going to flip their fucking shit, but they don't seem to be, we don't seem to be sharing the household workload. As, and I know some of y'all out there did, I'm not settle down, but, but it does seem, I know I didn't, you know, I mean, I did yard work and stuff like that and she wasn't doing that shit, but but the, the, the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, all that shit, um, the scheduling for the kids and stuff like she did all of that. And it seems like women are pushing back and saying, fuck that. And that is, and it's probably hard to clarify and classify, like what is the driver behind that 80% number? But do you see that uh, more? Have you seen that increase in men coming in your office because their wives filed? And if so, I know this is a long ass question. My apologies. Uh, why is that occurring? Do you think? And is it the gender the gender roles seem to be switching due to to income? You're absolutely, families? you're absolutely right. Women are filing more often for divorce because marriage doesn't work as well for women as it used to. So marriage never worked emotionally well for women because women have always wanted more connection and more closeness, and men have never been that very interested. But Men, the, it was it worked because men provided a certain level of financial security and social acceptability. You know, when women get divorced, what they talk about is nobody invites me over anymore. I'm a threat as a single unpartnered woman. They don't want me to come there around their husbands. Hmm. So it provides a social network for women and it provided provided. But now there's plenty of social networks for women without being a part of a couple and they're quite capable of so yeah, it's not, it's not as and plus it used to mean that they didn't have to work. So now it means they got to do all the work you just talked about and work outside the house. Yeah. So it's not as good a deal for women. And so they're turning up their noses at it more. And that's where a lot of men's anger comes from. It's like, wait a minute, my mom didn't leave my dad. My I'm not doing anything different than my dad. How come that's not working? How come that's not okay? So what uh you know. Obviously, I think the answer is um, at least partially. I mean, the answer, a answer is, you know, men uh, learn to be more open and, and vulnerable and talk about things and and create a deeper connection and and uh, do more shit around the house. But I can hear dudes screaming at me like, fuck you, fuck that. You know, I'm a man. And then but that's it, fine. It, it, that's but, fine. Man. You, go for it. Right. Be but is is that the answer, though, to, to be um, just I don't know. Um, I think the I think the answer starts with men talking to other men. So in the in the there's a chapter in my current book. Um, the book is Hidden in Plain Sight: How Men's Fears of Women Shape Their Intimate Relationships. Hmm. And there's a chapter for men on how to find other guys and start. I'm suggesting that you start it as a book group, hmm. read the book together, and talk about it. But then keep meeting yeah. and talking with each other. 
And I think that's the single most powerful thing. Your Facebook group is a great example of that. Any space in which men can talk in more open, personal ways. And it's so interesting that it's all on Zoom now because we one of the groups that I do, the guy was just really upset about something and um, crying in the group. And I said, have you talk to your wife about this. No, I, I, I'm afraid to. I said, well, here, let's do this. Why don't you like pause? We'll keep going. And you go talk to your wife and tell her what's bothering you and then come back. So he left group. He went and cried while his wife held him in her arms and came back and said, that is the first time I remember crying with my wife. I don't even remember the last time I did that. Hmm. So you- we can use talking with each other to help us talk with our partners. Hmm. I mean, there's this, uh, so much to, to, to the, 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 I could hear other people being like, see, being vulnerable is she's going to leave him. And I don't believe that, but I try, I always try to sort of play devil's advocate or see the other side. I try to, but um, I think, I think the answer lies in vulnerability for sure. But many more women leave men f- because of their inability or unwillingness to be open than leave them for being too open by, by, I don't know, hundred to one ratio. Yeah, it's not I that it doesn't that. ever happen, but that is not what's breaking up relationships. If you listen to a group of women talk privately, what they talk about is how frustrated they are. Who am I married to? Who is he? What does he really think? What's going on inside of him? He's an enigma to me. That's what women talk about. So you think uh, in part or maybe uh, a large part of, of the answer to men's loneliness is to get together with men and yes. actually talk about things, yes. n- not just go out and have drinks or whatever. Yes. Establish a culture that in, in which more personal conversation is valued. Yeah, I can't argue that. I, I wholeheartedly agree with it. Um, yeah. Well, this has been this has been awesome. I could probably keep doing this for you know like nice. th- three hours. So um, I, I love knowledge and 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 um, insight from someone that's you know you've been in this space. You, this is what you do. Um, this is your expertise, and um, I always love to pick someone's brain that that can speak to that because of their their experiences. You know, you you you've studied this stuff. You you you're around this stuff, and so being able to pick your your brain is really a treat for me. And I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. As for me as well. But again, I want to emphasize these are not brilliant ideas I had. These are <laughs> things I learned listening to men talk, and anybody can do that. You know, any woman listening to this show, listen, ask them questions. I think and that 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 does bring on and I'll I'll do this question and then I'll I'll hit the last one and we'll wrap up. Um because sometimes I I I did a an episode um a couple of weeks ago and I talked about when my wife ex soon to be ex-wife would get emotional how I would get angry because I couldn't deal with her emotions like we touched on this earlier. Um but it, but but there was a part of me going but what, okay, so that's on me, but what could she have done? Because I don't think it's fair to just say, oh, men, you are just fucking terrible. Uh, you're bad at emotion. And we are, but what is the woman's role in in this? And I think you just answered it, but I'm curious, I want to focus on it. In, I'll tell you where in, that's, in the relationship. I'll tell you where that sequence starts. Um, that sequence starts with men being withdrawn and unemotionally unavailable. And so women learn that the way to get our attention is to get more upset, even though we don't like it and say we don't like it, we do react more. And so we get less withdrawn and more. It may be anger, right. but bad loving is better than no loving. And so it feels better to women to get angry and get us angry because then at least there's a connection. And so for women, the task is to, is to, um, I think Gottman called a slower startup, you know, that you don't jump into the deep end just because you get a reaction because it's going to end up with him being even more withdrawn. So you take it slower and more gently and you say, can we talk about this? What's going on with you? You seem like you got really angry just then. Um, what pissed you off? What, right. you know, you you take it easy. You're right. gentler in your approach. Yeah, I, so I think- it works right. better. Yeah, well, they, they bear some responsibility too, right? I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, it has to be a two-person equation. So the last question that I ask everyone, and I'm definitely interested to get your take on this, is uh, what words of wisdom would you impart to a man who's just started this divorce process? 
I think what I just said, which is find other men to talk to, um, find a group of men who you can connect with, who will talk in more personal ways and and make them your community, make them your tribe, make them people. You know, when something happens and you're upset, don't start drinking. Call them. Well, uh, Avram, thank you very, very much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. How can people My find pleasure. you? How can people find the book? Um, what's the best? What kind of socials and all that good stuff? Sure. The book is Hidden in Plain Sight, How Men's Fears of Women Shape Their Intimate Relationships. It's available on Amazon. You can also find it on my website, which I should know by heart. It's Avram, avramweissphd.com. Gotcha. Thanks, But if Avram. you Google me, you'll find it. Gotcha. I appreciate it, sir. I will put uh, links and everything in, in the show notes. I'll add your book to the website for recommended reading. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you so very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I hope we can do it again sometime. Good talking to you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Thank you to Nick Coyle and Lifer for allowing me to use their song, Born Again, which you're hearing now and at the intro to the podcast. Thank you to Justin Dillahanty and all of my brothers at The Alpha Code. Please visit the website, risingphoenixpodcast.com to connect with me and other like-minded men who are looking to thrive and grow after their divorce. And remember to surround yourself with people who add value to your life, who challenge you to be greater than you were yesterday, who sprinkle magic into your existence like you do to theirs. Life is not meant to be done alone. Find your tribe. Take care.